Hi, I'm Jeff Maynard and I'll be exploring in the past tonight because I'll be talking about an Australian polar explorer, Sir Hubert Wilkins, and that will be my presentation tonight at this uh, Balmoral uh, Boat Club. In the immortal words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. <laughs> I like to get a sort of level of my audience when I start, see how sharp they are, see how bright they are. So I'm going to start with a quiz. Um, I'm going to show you the signature of a famous person, and you have to tell me who it is. Winston um, Churchill. Okay, fine. Winston Churchill. And we find this Winston Churchill signed a mention in dispatches in World War I for one G.H. Wilkins, George Hubert Wilkins. And a mention in dispatches was a bit of paper they gave you when they were too lousy to give you a medal, and uh, Wilkins got one in World War I um, uh, for doing clever things. Up a bit? Okay. Um, I'll, make it, I'll lower the bar a little bit for the second one and see if you can recognise the signature. There's two signatures there, uh, Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse, although they look suspiciously the same. I think actually Walt signed on behalf of Mickey. Mickey was probably in a voiceover recording studio or something doing some voiceovers at the time. And we find this, uh, it's now 13 years later and our George Hubert Wilkins from World War II is trying to get to, it's uh, 1931, he's trying to get to the North Pole in a submarine and uh, Walt's drawn a, a cartoon of Mickey in a submarine trying to go to the North Pole. Try this one. King George. Yeah, thank you. King George, and if you're not sure, George V. If you're not sure which one that was, he was played by Michael Gambon in the King's Speech. He had a beard. And we find this on a proclamation. Um, our Wilkins is knighted and he's heading off to the Antarctic and George writes a proclamation saying that if he finds anything, I own it, basically. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I love the language on this. Uh, the last paragraph, for example, Now know ye that we reposing a special trust and confidence in the discretion and faithfulness of our trusty and well-beloved Sir Hubert Wilkins Knight Bachelor aforesaid have nominated... And it goes on. If you want any idea on how far we've progressed as a civilization in the last century, you only need to compare the language of this with a Donald Trump tweet. <laughs> Oops. Uh, a few signatures here, but there's two that you'll find. People who are involved in aviation. Charles Lindbergh in the middle. Down the bottom, Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was the, world, the American ace from World War I. And on this one we find, um, on the League of... Aviators, which was a short-lived noble idea of aviators getting together, sort of flyers without boundaries type thing. And it was awarded to George Hubert Wilkins to commemorate his contribution to aviation. And notice some of the marks and things on it. Kingsford Smith got one of these as well. It's in the National Library. Um, this one's in a bit rougher condition. Um, fairly easy one to finish off. Anybody? Where are you, Mr. Strike? You're pretty sharp. No? Nobody? No. Um, Joe Stalin. Uh, no mention of Wilkins, but those of you who have read the Lowell Thomas book on Wilkins, at the end of it, Suzanne writes a little bit and talks about how when Wilkins was in Moscow in 1938, having Joe Stalin pin medals on him, um, Stalin autographed a picture, gave it to Wilkins to give to Wilkins' wife. And she writes in there that she used it as a bookmark. Uh, it was surrounded in red linen. And again, note the condition of it. Now, when you go to your grave and the kids drag all the crap out from under the bed and there's stuff signed by people from Joe Stalin to Walt Disney to Winston Churchill, it's safe to say you've had a fairly interesting and varied life. And that's the person I'm going to talk about tonight, Sir Hubert Wilkins. He was born in um, South Australia in 1888, um, about 100 miles north, I think. And at this homestead, which has since been restored, um, and is uh, Dick Smith, who's a member obviously of the Explorers Club, put a lot of work in, or contributed to the restoration of his home. Uh, early in his life, he got interested in cinematography, and that sort of became his ticket to the world, if you like. He took off to um, London around 1911. Here he is at the back of the plane. He's got his camera on his aeroplane. He's trying to take photographs from the air. Uh, went on his first Arctic expedition, got a new bowler hat to go for that, in 1913, went up to the Arctic 
and became, uh, the ship sank, didn't really work too well, but he became quite an accomplished, um, he fell in love with the ice basically, um, and, and became quite an accomplished, he was up there for three years surviving on the ice. Uh, he came back and they said there's this little thing going on in Europe called World War I, so he enlisted and uh, turned up at the Western Front or turned up in, 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 in London ready to be a pilot and they said no there's this bloke called Charles Bean who's recording the war and he needs photographers, you're one of them. And the other one was Frank Hurley and Wilkins and Hurley were good mates. They went across to uh, France, Hurley was only there for nine weeks but Wilkins stayed till the end of the war and produced an enormous catalogue of photographs for, which are now in the Australian War Memorial. Uh, at the end of the war he went to Gallipoli with Charles Bean and that's Wilkins at the back smoking the pipe uh, with Charles Bean just to the front of him. Uh, they went to uh, photograph um, the Gallipoli and, and the photographs that Wilkins took of um, Anzac COVID etc in the War Memorial. Around the end of the war he um, met a lady called Lorna Maitland, um, became friends, didn't get engaged to her until 1925, uh, but he met her towards the end of the war and they were good friends. Uh, end of the war, he, uh, one of his little adventures was to go in the England-Australia air race, which uh, the government offered money for anybody to fly, Australians to fly a British plane from England to Australia. Uh, that didn't work out all that well for him, uh, didn't get very far. Um, he went on a number of expeditions after he got back to Australia. One of the more notable ones, he was with um, Shackleton on Shackleton's last expedition in 1921. Shackleton died. Uh, then Wilkins spent a couple of years in the Australian uh, outback collecting for the British Museum. Uh, flora and fauna, he'd wander around the northern parts of Australia. He then got the idea that he's going to fly the Arctic and see if there's any new land up there. So in 1926, he got some aeroplanes, um, some sponsorship out of, um, out of America, went to the Arctic. Uh, he got two aeroplanes, both Fokkers, a uh, single engine Fokker, which is this one here. And he had a, um, a three engine Fokker as well, which you can see here at Fairbanks. It hasn't got the propellers on it yet. It's just being assembled. Again, that didn't work out too well for him. Um, so he did what every good Aussie does, he patched it up, he stuck it on eBay and he flogged it off to a bloke called Charles Kingsford Smith, who renamed it the Southern Cross and flew it across the Pacific. Um, he went back in 1927, this time using biplanes and tried to fly across the Arctic again. Uh, didn't work out, went back in 1928 with a new lighter Lockheed Vega aeroplane and that succeeded. He, was knight, he flew across the Arctic and he was knighted shortly afterwards. Uh, he also met at that time Suzanne Bennett, an Australian actress who was um, uh, working on Broadway. Uh, he then went in 1928, he went down to the Antarctic. He was the first person to fly over the Antarctic. Uh, he took the same aeroplane, the Lockheed Vega, um, made the first flights, discovered land from the air for the first time. He actually took a series of beautiful uh, photographs from the air, the first ever aerial photo photo photography or aerial photographs of the Antarctic. They're only kind of low res, which is all I can get at the moment, but um, uh, he, he, was a, he always photographed, everywhere he went he took photographs. Um, and these are 1928. Um, in between sort of trips to the Antarctic, he went around the world in the Graf Zeppelin. That was um, no, basically a publicity flight and he was a guest, but he still went around the world and the thing. Uh, and he broke off his engagement to Lorna Maitland, the lady he met at the end of World War I, and he married Suzanne Bennett. Um, he then in 19, or towards the end of 1929, 30, he started planning his biggest expedition, most ambitious expedition yet, and that was to take a submarine under the Arctic ice and get to the North Pole. Um, he got a, an old submarine, called it the Nautilus, um, took it from New York to try to struggle across the Atlantic. It had to go into dry dock in England, uh, but he still managed to get north. And many of you will have seen um, Simon Nash's documentary, The Last Voyage of the Nautilus, where it's filmed and you see them actually going under the ice and he films out the porthole 
Uh, he also, on that voyage to the, um, uh, attempting to get under the ice, uh, he took a little 35mm camera, 35mm Leica with him, and uh, that's the camera there. And he took colour photographs under the ice out of the porthole as well. So they're the first actual under ice photographs. Um, the submarine expedition didn't work, it left him broke and it left him in debt to this fellow who was a wealthy American, Lincoln Ellsworth. Ellsworth had ambitions of being the first person to fly over the Antarctic. No one had actually flown from one side to the Antarctic and back. And if I can, there's quite a bit of film but I won't give you all of it. I'll give you 60 seconds of film. This is Ellsworth. He went, Ellsworth went four times. This is his first expedition. They're leaving Dunedin in New Zealand. They're all roaring drunk and they sail down the harbour to Port Chalmers. They get out into the Southern Ocean. They get to the ice shelf. Um, they unload their plane. This is 19, January 1934. They unload their plane. Um, they assemble it. Uh, Ellsworth and the pilot burnt Balkan. They go up for a test flight. Everything's fine. And at the moment they're parked on the Ross Ice Shelf because it's nice and flat, it's an airfield. So they take the thing off, they fly it, they say we're good to go, tomorrow we're going to fly across Antarctica. During the night, that's the plane over in the distance, that black thing, the ice shelf breaks up. Yeah. And so the men go across the sort of heaving flows of ice and sort of think we better see what's wrong with the plane. So they walk across there and, um, and try and get to the plane. Um, the, Wyatt, the ship was called the Wyatt Earp because Ellsworth, Lincoln Ellsworth's hero was Wyatt Earp. And when they get to the plane, it's actually fallen into one of the cracks in the ice. And so they manoeuvre the Wyatt Earp really close, um, hook the plane up. But as they lift it up, the undercarriage is damaged and that's the end of the first expedition. They went back a year later, had more problems. They went back a year later, they got it right. Ellsworth flew over the, flew over um, Antarctica and... Um, that's the wider ship there. Um, and that's the third year they're at um, Dundee Island on the Antarctic Pen Peninsula before they're ready to take off. Ellsworth flew over. He also took photographs uh, of aerial photographs of the Antarctic, the highlands, which the first person to do so. Uh, one of the, this is a side, this is, I'm, I'm throwing this in because I love it. Um, and it only happened about two or three weeks ago. But I found Ellsworth's list of stuff he carried. And one of the things he carried about in the middle was Wyatt Earp cartridge belt. Ellsworth had a lot of money. Wyatt Earp died in 1929. Ellsworth went and saw Josephine, gave her money. She gave him Wyatt Earp stuff, and, um, including Wyatt Earp cartridge belt. And about four weeks ago, I tracked it down to the American Museum of Natural History. And they said, oh yeah, we've got this belt. And they looked at a little tag that said donated by Lincoln Ellsworth and given to him by Josephine or Mrs. Earp, they called her. After the uh, Ellsworth had got across Antarctica, uh, Wilkins basically wanted to go back and do another submarine. He spent a lot of his time trying to raise money for another submarine expedition to get to the North Pole to prove it could be done. And this is like a prospectus where he's saying, sponsor it and we'll you know, we'll call it the Cadbury Wilkins Transarctic Submarine Expedition. Uh, he stayed married to Suzanne. They always travelled together. Uh, they didn't actually have any children. Um, although at one point she wandered down to the orphanage, picked up a little, I estimate, five-year-old girl and adopted her, renamed her Suzanne in her own image. And I don't even know what happened to the girl. She's never mentioned again, I suspect. Suzanne tired of her in a week and took her back to the orphanage. But Wilkins was in Antarctica when this has happened and, um, and uh, the Pope press said he's, he's got a daughter but he doesn't know it. Um, Wilkins toured and lectured most of his life. Um, he made his money through the 1930s to the 1940s. He would talk about his flights, he would talk about his uh, submarine expedition and he would, tour, he would show his films and, um, and travel. He stayed married to Suzanne, and um, as I said before, the, the marriage produced no children. Um, now, in a very brief time, that's his life, but his ability as an aviator, his ability as a submariner, as a photographer, um, 
all these things. His greatest genius, by far, was his, his ability to disappear from the history books. Uh, this photograph, taken during World War I, has got Wilkins behind the camera taking photographs on this tank. And a few years ago, the Australian Mint decided that they would strike a coin for uh, war historians. So they thought, great, they'll use that, that photograph for the coin. And they produced it, and they took Wilkins out of the picture. And that summarises his life. And in this kind of vacuum, if you like, the reputation of other people uh, filled up that vacuum. Uh, this photo hangs in the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne. Um, it's a war photograph, World War I photograph. The caption under it says, um, that's the Battle of Amiens, 8th of August, a photo attributed to Frank Hurley. Uh, Frank Hurley was in Sydney, Australia during the Battle of Amiens, but they attribute the photo to him because he had the reputation as being the World War I photographer, whereas Wilkins was um, largely overlooked. So nine months after Frank Hurley's left the Western Front, they're still attributing photos to him. Um, one of the remarkable things and what my presentation tonight is about is, as I've called it the lost records of C. Hubert Wilkins for a purpose, is that throughout his life he collected everything. He would throw nothing away. I wondered at first whether it was a sense of destiny, he had to keep everything. But I don't think it was. I think he was OCD. He just hoarded. He would not throw anything away. If he, was, if he had a sense of his own destiny, he would have um, thrown the crap out and kept the good stuff. But he didn't. Um, going right back, here's a business card from when he went to the Balkans War as a, as a photographer in 1912. Um, he was also a ladies' man. He used to get people sending him postcards. This one, uh, he kept them all. Uh, this one on the back says, Dear Wilkie, this is 1913. Uh, Dear Wilkie, Marion was so disappointed not to see you the other evening. Can you come over next Saturday or Sunday? Love, Margot. In the corner she's written, or Friday evening. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping, hoping he turned up. Um, he kept um, a reference from one of his first jobs in Adelaide. Uh, says he's worked for Bullock and Fulton from November 1905 to the 12th Inst, which is 1908. Um, he kept, when he went to um, Gallipoli, with, pick up a little guidebook, he would keep it. Um, this was given to him, this is a little match case, was given to him by Edward VIII, uh, when Edward, the, that was Prince of Wales, the one that abdicated, when he inspected the submarine in 1931, he gave him a little matchbox um, with the coat of arms of London on the front. And I know Wilkins has kept it because when you open it, uh, there's a spent book of uh, matches in it from the Quartermaster Corps where Wilkins worked as a consultant in uh, the 1950s. So he's carried this with him all his life with the matches. Um, when he was on the Zeppelin, he kept the menus. So you can see we had scrambled eggs on the first day and I think for lunch we had, um, sorry, for lunch we had uh, boneless pigeon. So um, he kept luggage tags. He would not throw out his luggage tags. Uh, receipts, basically whatever it was, he kept it. Notes. Um, these are German belt buckles from World War I. Some poor soldier. He captured, actually captured soldiers in, in, during the... Uh, First World War, um, and, and he souvenir their belt buckles. So this poor some Germans walking around trying to hold his pants up and surrender at the same time. Wilkins would have nicked them and kept them and said thanks very much. Um, I came up from Melbourne this morning. I didn't keep my boarding pass, but he did. He, this is his boarding pass for the Hindenburg airship. He's got on the Hindenburg. He was on the maiden flight. It's May 36. He's kept his boarding pass. Um, bank books, whatever it was, he didn't throw anything out. Uh, and this was interesting. Well, uh, this is the original spec sheet for the Southern Cross, the aeroplane. Um, Anthony Fokker's changed some of the dimensions on it because the Southern Cross or the Fokker tri-motor that Wilkins bought had a slightly wider wingspan than previous ones. And Wilkins sent this to his mother saying, this is the type of aeroplane I will have, but mine will be a bit larger than this one, George. Um, Whatever it was, he kept it. Now, all the stuff he kept, 
when he died in 1958, was in this farmhouse in Pennsylvania. Uh, Suzanne called it Walhalla because she was uh, born in Walhalla, Victoria. Note the car there in a minute. Uh, and she would dress up in her gowns and mow the lawn and she lived with Winston Ross who never wore a shirt. And um, they lived on this farmhouse. That's Sir Hubert on the right hand side as an old man at the farmhouse. And you saw the size of the farmhouse, it had a large cellar and it was full of his stuff. It was full. They had a shed down by the lake that I'd say was about the size of a four car garage. That was full. At a nearby town, they had a Baptist church. Um, it no longer, it was a wooden one, it no longer exists, but that was full. So you had three sizable buildings full of all the stuff he'd kept when he died in 1958. Um, in his will, he left everything to Suzanne. And she had an ongoing relationship with Winston Ross, who still couldn't buy a shirt. Um, <laughs> But what Suzanne did when he died was to go through all his stuff and burn anything that had any, any mention of other women. Any letters to other women, any mention of Lorna Maitland, the woman that Wilkins knew for seven years, got engaged to and then knew for another three years before um, Mary, just destroyed it. How much she destroyed, we don't know, but it was a lot. I estimate from the gaps it was a lot. When Suzanne died in the early 70s, she left everything to Winston Ross. Um, Winston Ross didn't know what to do with it. Uh, on the back of this actual photo of the two of them, uh, about five years after she's died, Winston Ross has scrawled, probably when he's had too many red wines, uh, starting a line down, he says, he scrawled across there, what a wasted life it seems in 1979. 25 years later, I don't know what 25 years later means. Does it matter? Does anything? I'm deluged with duty. Should I bother? All rooms uphill and down dale are filled. And then he starts going up the side. Does prosperity care? Junk sells at all yards and we have historical junk. Winston Ross basically inherited three buildings full of historical junk of this Australian polar explorer and didn't know what to do with it. Uh, one of the, he started selling it basically. He, he thought, what I'll do is I'll, you know, I've got to get some money. He had no income. He was an actor. Huh. Um, Wilkins had this lovely 1939 Chevrolet Woody. Uh, there's Wilkins with it. It's one of those cars that it just looks naked without a surfboard on top. Um, uh, with uh, Dick Smith uh, from here, went across in 1982. Winston Ross sold him the Chevy. Dick uh, brought it back to Australia, had it restored, it's in Canberra. Um, uh, when that's Lincoln Ellsworth in a pose photo before he's setting off to cross Antarctica, he had three of these sleds on the wide earth. Uh, Winston Ross sold one of them to Dick Smith and Dick Smith brought it back to Australia and we, we took photos of it and I blew this photo up and we looked at all the bindings and that's one of the sleds off the wide earth. And it's, Dick Smith's got one here. Winston Ross gave, gave another sled to the Explorers Club in New York uh, on condition that they waive his fees for the rest of his natural life. <laughs> so he gave them a sled. He didn't pay fees for the Explorers Club. God, I wish I had a sled. He didn't pay <laughs> Explorer Club fees for the rest of his life. And they've got one in, um, in New York. I don't know what happened to the third one, but there were three. Um, a big thing about Wilkins, he sponsored all his expeditions by um, taking postcards and things on the submarines in his aeroplanes. You would pay a dollar, two dollars, um, you'd address a letter to you, he would take it somewhere, it would be stamped, the stamp would be cancelled and then it would be posted to you. And so you say, I've got a postcard or something that's gone to the North Pole. This one's from his submarine expedition. and. Um, this is just a brochure when he was selling his submarine expedition. But in this farmhouse in Pennsylvania and this church and this shed were literally thousands and thousands of these which um, collectors wanted. And in 1980, Winston Ross met this man, uh, Dave Larson, or David Larson. Uh, 
this is this is David Larson in 2013. David Larson met Winston Ross and said, "You have a gold mine here in these. They call them covers. There are there are." Uh, an envelope with a stamp that's been cancelled somewhere. You have a fortune in these covers. Uh, Winston Ross thought, but money. Uh, so David Larson, a couple of other people, um, and Winston Ross, on the 50th anniversary of the submarine expedition in 1981, made up these special covers and took them, that, that's the reverse, it's a stamp festival at Madison Square Garden in 1981 and they started selling these and Winston Ross is going, great, I'm getting money. Uh, Dr. Larson or David Larson and the other people and Winston Ross um, then argued. They argued Winston Ross was letting them come into the farmhouse and take out boxes of stuff. And there was a box of letters that Suzanne had written before she died, oh sorry, Sir Hubert had sent to Suzanne. and. Suzanne had kept them. There was about 200 personal letters. Uh, Suzanne had written on the top of the box, the contents of this box are to be destroyed upon my death. Um, Winston Ross didn't do that. These guys, David Larson and the others, went in and they carried out this box of letters thinking, Phew. Winston Ross said, I want them back. They said, no, we've paid you money. They're ours. They got into a long-running court battle. Um, that went on for quite a while. One of the good things about it is they, uh, Winston Ross sued these collectors. Um, they stalled him in the state of Pennsylvania and then countersued him from different states to basically tie him up in court and send him broke. Uh, this went on for ages, but one of the good things about it is what they went through all the collection and they started writing down all the stuff that was there. And so it gives us a clue as to what was there. Um, after Winston Ross just surrendered, he couldn't keep paying his lawyers fees to fight this fight. He gave it up and said, fine, I will sell it to the Ohio State University. Uh, he did. In 1985, he signed the contracts and the Ohio State University had a small library and a fellow called Peter Anderson started loading interns and students into trucks, driving them up to the farmhouse in Pennsylvania, loading boxes of stuff in the trucks and taking it back to Ohio. Uh, this letter is just, uh, this is a 1988, he's, uh, Peter Anderson has just come back from a trip, he writes and thanks Winston and, uh, and his wife Marley, but the middle, middle paragraph says, we unloaded the truck on Wednesday, October 19th and loaded everything but the frame, places, oil, sketches, etc. onto pallets, um, onto pallets so the material could be fumigated. There were spiders in several boxes and it is easy to treat all the material in a non-damaging fumigation process. Now this avoids bugs traveling, blah, blah, blah. The clothing is pretty well covered with mildew and seems to be fungus and that could also have to be treated. And then he goes on and says, I've got five people unloading the boxes and we'll fumigate it and come back later on and get some more. Uh, Winston Ross didn't look after the stuff. Um, it was, it's a, it's a cold area. I know a couple of people here have been there. Uh, it's cold. When the Ohio State University got what Suzanne didn't destroy, um, uh, it was in a bad state. Now, what happened after that was while Peter Anderson was driving up and down to the farmhouse, I don't know how many hours drive it is from Columbus to Pennsylvania, um, while he was driving backwards and forwards, he suffered a brain tumour. And um, he went away to learn to walk again, had to have all the operations, lost his speech and everything. It took him about 18 months to, to walk again. And when he went back to Ohio to the library and said, you know, I'm back, I want my job back, they said, there's no job for you. So he left and he, he never went back to Ohio. So because of that, we don't actually know if he cleaned out the farmhouse or the church or the shed. And um, I tracked him down. He had no contact for 30 years with the um, Ohio State University. Um, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Uh, I tracked him down, that's Peter Anse on the left. Um, I've got my best deer in the headlights, look. Uh, Lynn Lay on the left, she was one of the students at Ohio who was an intern at the time and she'd jump in the truck and go up with Peter Anderson up to the farmhouse, load the stuff, bring it back. And Laura Kissel on the right, she's the current archivist. Um, but we actually found Peter Anderson, went and visited him and I'd say 
did you, you know, did you clean out the farmhouse? Was there anything left? And he still had a lot of problems with his speech and thing. He was shaky. He just said, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember. Uh, it's actually one of the saddest or not saddest, um, one of the most emotional meetings I've had in this kind of journey to meet this guy because in 30 years, no one had come back to talk to him from Ohio. But he said, I don't remember, I don't remember. But we do know a lot of material was left in the farmhouse. Ohio didn't get it all. Um, Ohio got what they got. They took it back. This is the archive at Ohio. And um, originally they had about, well, and it, but if you go out the back, they've got all their Wilk and stuff stacked and sorted and um, defumigated. Um, but there was more stuff in the farmhouse. Uh, oh, sorry, that's me again at Ohio with his um, military cross from World War I. Um, and uh, what happens to the collectors who took all these letters and things? They, um, they took them. And in a couple of cases, and I need to be careful because some of these people are still alive, um, but in a couple of cases, these people would collect these letters. Um, in a couple of cases, their wife thought that rotten hobby of yours, collecting all these things, I don't want to know about it. But when they get divorced, suddenly the wife's lawyers want to know how much all this stuff's worth. worth. So when they get divorced, the person who's been collecting all this stuff sticks the letters under there where no one will find them, and especially not the lawyers. And a few years after, brings them out and starts putting them, selling them. These are um, these three letters were sold at auction. I think it was Bonhams or something like that. Sold anonymously. They were Wilkins writing to his mother uh, on Shackleton's last expedition. Um, anything with Shackleton's name on it is valuable, and I think the three letters sold for six thousand um, dollars. Mike Ross was the adopted son of Winston Ross. Uh, Mike wasn't allowed because of family disputes into the farmhouse. Uh, after, um, after Suzanne had died and after Winston had died, he wasn't allowed into the farmhouse, but he um, went there in his car, um, broke in, loaded up a whole lot of boxes and took them back to Fremont in Michigan. I visited him in 2014 and he said, yeah, I got some boxes. Uh, and he stacked up, he had in his workshop, he was a gunsmith, he used to make guns, uh, barrels, high precision rifles sort of turn lays and things. That's him over in the back in this, um, having a cigarette. And he stacked up all these, we went and got them out of a neighbor's barn. He stacked up the boxes and I started going through them. And when I looked inside, they looked like this. Uh, um, hadn't been looked after. Uh, there's the German belt buckles in the middle. Um, there's books, there's photographic plates, there's manuscripts. A lot of manuscripts, actually, because Wilkins continually wrote and rewrote his autobiography. And he'd add a chapter, he'd take away a chapter, um, uh, he, he, and he, he kept all the drafts. That's some sort of editing notes from something. Again, you can see the condition. Um, just uh, Winston Ross called it, what was it, a historical junk or something, and it's, uh, that's how it was treated. Um, one of the beautiful things I did find in the barn, which I have to make comment on, was um, volume 12 of the official history of World War I. Um, the, uh, at the end of the war, it's the photographic volume, it's the volume of, of, of um, just photographs. And uh, Charles Bean alerted to Wilkins to this when it was published. It was published in 1922. Wilkins was in Queensland at the time. Wilkins obviously got a copy and thought, Butte, and I thought, oh, Butte, here's Wilkins' copy of, of, um, of the official history. Now, the way the War Memorial works and the records we have in the War Memorial, we don't actually know who took what photo from the Western Front. A couple are attributed to Frank Hurley, a couple are attributed to different people, but most are simply unofficial, or, sorry, official Australian photographer. So we've never had any sort of record of who took the photos. Anyway, I picked up Wilkins' book and I was flicking through, and I noticed something under the right-hand corner of the photograph in pencil. And when I looked, he's initialed the photograph, GHW. And I thought, bugger, you know, OCD, he's gone through and he's initialed the photographs he took from the First World War. And he's initialed 178 photographs. We can now credit to Wilkins that we did not know before. And we can say he took these, and this amazing iconic photographs. And we say, 
you know, he's either taken them or he believes he took them because he's written his initials, GHW, under all these photographs. Um, letters to his mother from the Western Front. Um, census copy. He, he, when, when he'd take photographs, he'd get a copy of the censor. He'd have to submit them to the censor. They'd number the photograph, the glass plate. They would um, put subject, what date, where it was taken, all that. He kept all this. is all Wilkins kept all this. He just didn't throw anything out. And a lot of this stuff is in the War Memorial. Um, I, it, was an, it was a funny story. It was an Amish barn where Mike Ross had kept the stuff. And I said, look, he was driving me back to the airport the last day. I spent a week with him. Last day, I'm going back to the airport, Grand Rapids Airport, with Mike Ross. He had a, he had a pickup truck the size of a backyard swimming pool. And he's driving me back. And I said, all this stuff, you know, I've, I've found and all this stuff. It's been sitting in an Amish barn for over 20 years, Mike. I've got to get a photo of the barn before we go back. So he pulled off the side of the road. We stopped there. I stood outside the fence. They were very shy and they don't like their photographs taken. Uh, and I stood outside the fence and he said, there's the barn. I said, thank you. And he took me to the airport. Um, we're basically here tonight because, well, for a lot of reasons, I'm an interesting talker. But that's the Hubert on the left and he was a member of the Explorers Club. And there he is with Ben Eilson, uh, his friend and pilot, and see Hubert's holding the Explorers Club flag there. Um, he's also, see Hubert is the only Australian to win the Explorers Club medal. Um, not the only member of this branch, there was the Kiwis, but we don't count them. Um, one Kiwi you might have heard of called Sir Edmund Hillary. But see Hubert is the only Australian who's won the Explorers Club medal. And I said to um, Todd, Last year, I think I found his Explorers Club medal. And Todd goes, really? You know, I said, yeah, yeah, I think I have, I think I have. Um, but I stand corrected, I hadn't. Um, his Explorers Club medal is uh, in the Ohio State University. That's the front of it, it's quite it's larger. And on the back, it's to Sir Hubert Wilkins, um, member of the Explorers Club for the first to fly an aeroplane across, sorry, airplane, it's American, airplane across the Arctic, first to fly in the Antarctic and first to discover land by air. So he got the Explorers Club medal. And I thought, well, I don't know what it is I've found because I found, I came across this, which is a bracelet. And it's Explorers Club. It's a silver bracelet. On the back it says Sir Hubert Wilkins, number 27. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, it's not his medal. Now, I don't know what the number 27 means. He wasn't the 27th person to get the Explorers Club medal. Um, he was the 15th. And the only thing, perhaps, he might have been the 27th person to be made um, a life member because they would give away life memberships as well. Um, but I'm not quite sure. We're good again. Okay. Um, so I'm not quite sure what he got that for. I do know <laughs> he wore it all his life. Um, oh no, I'll go back before I plug my books. Um, I would estimate of what was in the farmhouse and the church and the shed. If you took away the crap which by that I mean old newspaper cuttings and all that, and you just were left with his letters, his photographs, his journals, and all the things that were sort of historically significant. If you took away the stuff and you said, what's there? About 50% of it has got to Ohio. The other 50%. And of the 50% that has not got to Columbus, Ohio, to the archive there, um, what percentage of what was, would have remained was destroyed by Suzanne, I don't know. Um, and what percentage is still held by collectors? And collectors hold boxes and boxes of stuff. Uh, what percentage is held by them? I can't say. But I'd estimate that about 50% of his stuff um, has been preserved properly. And the other half is either being burnt or is still uh, Wilkins is a work in progress for me. There's still stuff I'm chasing. So I'm still trying to locate, I'm still trying to copy, I'm still trying to say, okay. Um, 
in particular, the 1920s are a bit bleak, but that was when he's running around with a lot of women, so I, I don't know how much of that stuff Suzanne bought. Uh, sorry, burnt. Um, a few years ago, a very clever fellow called Simon Nash wrote a very good biography of C. Hubert called The Last Explorer, and I went, damn, you know, uh, I would have done that. So I thought what I'll do is I'll go into his life and take incidences or episodes from his life and try and flush them out, try and write more about a particular thing. And my first book was Wings of Ice, which told about his flights and things like that. The second book was his time at the Western Front. Uh, and the third's just been released, is about his time with Lincoln Ellsworth uh, flying across Antarctica. Yeah, you wrote them down, good. Um, that was Sir Hubert Wilkins. Now, um, as I said, he's a remarkable Australian. He's been overlooked by history through his wife and then Winston Ross. His material was either destroyed or damaged or sold and it's still missing. Um, but he is, as I said, the only person to um, win the Explorers Club medal. And um, uh, I was actually getting on the plane this morning. I thought, my God, I'm going to Sydney to talk at the Explorers Club. I should, I should have Sir Hubert with me. He'd be here in spirit. He was a spiritualist and a mystic as well. So um, he's, he's with us tonight. I actually brought his little um, his Explorers Club medal with his name on the back that he's... Oops, there it is, up the right way. With his name on the back that he's carried all his life in his pocket or on his wrist, I'd say. So I'd like to think in some way Sir Hubert is um, uh, here with us tonight. And if he was here with us tonight in the flesh, he'd be over on the bar leaning and having a beer and going, what a lot of crap. But, um, but he's, he's here with us tonight, that's Sir Hubert Wilkins. Um, not sure how I did on time, Todd, but I'll take some questions if people want. Oh, sorry, one last little quote. Uh, one of the letters I found, he was leaving for America. He wrote to his mother and said, look, I have to carry the American flag on these expeditions, but I will always carry the Australian flag as well, because someday Australia will understand. And it's kind of my hope and the hope of other people that I know here tonight who have an interest in Sir Hubert, that we make his story better known. And we, um, uh, in, so, in some way, in some sort of metaphysical way, we can bring him home and, and let his story be told. Um, there you go. I'll take questions.